This lecture is on the cellular level of organization. What are cells? Cells are the smallest units of organized life. For billions of years, life on Earth consisted of single-celled organisms, such as bacteria. Around 600 million years ago, cells formed the first multicellular plants and animals. Cells require a watery environment containing the appropriate atoms, molecules, and chemical reactions. All cells must obtain nutrients, form new chemical structures, and dispose of waste molecules. This is true whether the cell is a single bacterium or a multicellular organism. Bacteria were the first cells. They are prokaryotes, meaning they do not have a nucleus. Protestin, plant, and animal cells appeared after bacteria. They are eukaryotes and have a nucleus. Prokaryote means before the nucleus. Eukaryote means a true nucleus. Both prokaryote and eukaryote cells have the following structures. Plasma membrane, which is the flexible outer boundary. Cytoplasm, which is the intracellular fluid containing organelles. And non-membrane bound organelles such as ribosomes, which synthesize proteins as a result of DNA. This illustration shows a typical prokaryote cell and a eukaryote cell. Cells are responsible for maintaining homeostasis. Human cells are not the only cells in the body. It is estimated that there are 10 bacterial cells for every human cell. Our microbiome helps protect us from pathogens, digest and absorb nutrients, and synthesize important vitamins. This illustration shows how much of your body is taken up by microbial cells versus your own human cells. All of your native bacteria in your body make up your microbiome. These are beneficial bacteria they are not the pathogenic bacteria that cause illness. There are over 200 different types of human cells in the body. The structure of each type of cell is suited to its function. Figure A shows cells that connect body parts, form linings, or transport gases. Fibroblasts secrete collagen, which connects and binds all body tissues together. Epithelial cells form linings and boundaries, such as of your skin and the internal membranes of your GI tract. Erythrocytes, or red blood cells, transport gases, like oxygen, through your body. Figure B shows cells that move organs and body parts. Muscle cells are a great example. Figure C so shows cells that store nutrients, such as fat cells. Figure D shows cells that fight disease, like macrophages, which are a type of white blood cell. Figure E shows cells that gather information and control body functions, like this multipolar nerve cell. And figure F shows the male cell of reproduction, called the sperm. The female reproductive cell is the egg. Let's go through the different parts of the human eukaryotic cell, starting with the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane forms a physical barrier between the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. Intracellular fluid is called cytosol and is located within the cell. Extracellular fluid is located outside of the cell. Extracellular fluid includes tissue fluid, also known as interstitial fluid, plasma, and lymph. The intracellular fluid, abbreviated ICF, takes up about 40% of the body's weight. So nearly half of the body's weight includes the water that is found within our cells. The extracellular fluid comprises about 20% of our body's weight. And remember, that includes tissue fluid, plasma, and lymph. 
The plasma membrane is called the phospholipid bilayer. Hydrophilic heads interact with the watery solutions of the intracellular and extracellular fluid. The hydrophobic tails are tucked away from the water. This makes the cell membrane semi-permeable and is important in regulating the movement of solutes and water into and out of the cell. The hydrophilic heads are facing the water in the extracellular and intracellular fluid. These are made up of polar phosphate molecules. The hydrophobic tails face away from the watery environment because these are made up of fatty acid chains. The fluid mosaic model of the phospholipid bilayer reflects that phospholipids are interspersed with proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. The proteins are shown in purple and they can extend all the way through the cell membrane and are called integral proteins or they may be located on the periphery of the cell membrane, either on the interior or exterior. These are called peripheral proteins. The fats include cholesterol. Cholesterol has a waxy consistency and helps to stabilize the cell membrane, which is an oily consistency. The carbohydrates form the glycocalyx, which aids in cell-to-cell -cell communication. Functions of the plasma membrane include several things. The first is selective permeability. This regulates the transport of water and solutes into and out of the cell. The hydrophobic phosphate tails only interact with small, nonpolar molecules and gases. Transport proteins act as channels and pumps to move ions and polar molecules across the membrane. Other functions include an electrical gradient. This is called the resting membrane potential, abbreviated RMP. Sodium and potassium ions are distributed across the plasma membrane so that the interior of the plasma membrane is negative relative to the exterior. This can be physiologically reversed to conduct electrical impulses along nerve and muscle cells. In this illustration, the round ions are sodium ions and the diamond-shaped ions are potassium. There will be more sodium on the outside of the cell and more potassium on the inside of the cell. Notice that there are a lot of transport proteins that allow for leakage of potassium out of the cell. And then there is a sodium potassium pump right here, a type of protein pump, that pumps sodium out of the cell. With this constant outflow of positively charged ions, we end up with a negative interior charge. We will talk about this several times this semester. Another function of the plasma membrane is communication between other cells. Cells will contain receptor proteins for neurotransmitters, hormones, and antibodies. This is a receptor protein that will receive either a neurotransmitter, a hormone, or an antibody. Cells also contain identification sugars called the glycocalyx, and this serves as cell-to-cell -cell communication particularly for the immune system. Your body recognizes your, your self cells by their glycocalyx. Then they also recognize pathogenic cells because the glycocalyx is different from your self cells. Let's talk about transport across the plasma membrane. Solutes and water are selectively transported across the cell membrane. There are two major ways this occurs. Passive transport does not require ATP. Substances will move down a concentration gradient. Active transport requires ATP. Substances will move against a concentration gradient. The first image shows passive transport. Notice that the substances are moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. This is what is meant by moving down a concentration gradient. We are going from a high 
to a low concentration. This does not require energy. In active transport, we are going from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. Notice that the diamond-shaped potassium cells are less in number in the exterior of the cell and they are in greater number in the interior of the cell. The sodium potassium pump is using energy in the form of ATP to actively pump potassium ions from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. This is what is meant by going against a concentration gradient. In passive transport, substances move down their concentration gradient. This does not require ATP because the concentration gradient carries the solutes along as if moving down a slide. Diffusion is the passive transport of solutes. Osmosis is the passive transport of the solvent, which is water. This illustration shows a slide. If you're moving from a high to low concentration, you do not need energy. This is passive. Diffusion can be classified as simple or facilitated. Simple diffusion transports nonpolar particles directly through the plasma membrane. Examples include oxygen, carbon dioxide, and certain metabolic wastes. Water is an exception. It is polar, but it can undergo simple diffusion. Facilitated diffusion transports ions and polar molecules through a transport protein. The transport protein has a hydrophobic exterior that interacts with the phospholipid tails. It has a hydrophilic interior that interacts with ions and polar molecules. Examples include glucose, sodium ions, and chloride ions. Water can also move into the cell through facilitated diffusion. Simple diffusion of molecules directly through the phospholipid bilayer. In the first frame, we see that there are small nonpolar molecules on the extracellular fluid of the plasma membrane. Over time, these small nonpolar molecules will diffuse directly through the, cyto or the plasma membrane into the cytoplasm until they reach chemical equilibrium. This is simple diffusion. Facilitated diffusion occurs when a transport protein is necessary. This illustration shows a channel protein. Mostly ions will move through channel proteins selected on their basis of size and charge. These are generally specific to a particular ion. Facilitated diffusion may also occur through a protein carrier that is specific for one chemical and this chemical may change the shape in the transport protein as the protein facilitates its movement into the cell. So here we see lipid sol insoluble solutes such as sugars or amino acids and this is not using energy to change shape and move the solutes into the cell because we're still going down our concentration gradient. But this protein carrier still does undergo a shape change. Just kind of like when you swallow liquid or food and it goes from your mouth to stomach through your esophagus, the esophagus has to stretch a little bit to let that liquid or food through. Osmosis is the diffusion of a solvent, such as water, down its concentration gradient. If you remember that water follows salt, this will help you to remember the principle of osmosis. Osmosis affects the tonicity of a cell. The tonicity is the ability of a solution's solute concentration to cause a cell to maintain shape, shrink, or swell. The three solutions found within the body are isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic. In the isotonic solution, iso means equal. There is equal concentrations of solutes inside and outside of the cell membrane. 
This maintains the shape of the cell. In a hypertonic solution, there are more solutes outside of the cell than inside. So remember, water follows salt. Since there's more salt on the outside, water will leave the cell to join with the salt. It wants to dilute the concentration outside of the cell. This will cause the cell to shrink. In a hypotonic solution, there is more salt inside the cell than outside. Remember, water follows salt. And in this case, the water is going to go inside the cell where there is more salt. It is going to want to dilute the concentration of salt within the cell. This causes the cell to swell up. The isotonic solution is a solution with the same solute concentration as the cytosol. Solute concentration is equal on both sides of the cell. This is equal to about 0.9% saline or a 5% glucose solution. The cell is able to maintain the function in the body because it is maintaining its normal proper shape. In a hypertonic solution, this is a solution that has a greater solute concentration than that of the cytosol. Basically, you have put the cell in salt water. Water is pulled out of the cell and into the solution. Because remember, water follows salt, and so water is going to want to dilute the salt water. A hypertonic solution is considered greater than 0.9% saline or greater than 5% glucose. In this type of solution, the cell will shrink, also known as crenation, and thus function will be impaired. In a hypotonic solution, this solution has lesser solute concentration than that of the cytoplasm. Water is pulled out of the solution and into the cell. A hypotonic solution is considered less than 0.9% saline or less than 5% glucose. As the water goes from the solution into the cell, the cell may swell up and burst, also called lice. This is a silent video on osmotic pressure and the effect of blood cells on cells. We can watch it since it's silent anyway. I'll talk you through it. What we're seeing here are cells in an isotonic solution. These are the erythrocytes. These are the white blood cells. Notice that they are maintaining their shape. Now the researchers have added salt. The cells are thus in a hypertonic solution. There is more salt in the solution now than there is in the cells themselves. You can already see that the cells are starting to lose their water into the solution surrounding them. Notice that they are shrinking. Now the researchers have added an isotonic solution. See how the cells are regaining their proper shape. Next up will be distilled water, which is pure water. What I want you to notice is the cells are already starting to swell because there is more water in the solution around the cells than inside the cells. Water follows salt. Therefore, water is going to go into the cells so it can dilute the salt that is in the cell. It wants to be at equilibrium, so water will follow salt. It will go into the cell. The cells are going to swell up, and you're going to see the erythrocytes disappear as their membranes break down, and you're going to actually see the white blood cells explode. Watch. There they go. Clearly important to maintaining homeostasis in the body. We want to make sure that we are in an isotonic solution. All right, we're in active transport now. In active transport, substances move against their concentration gradient. This requires ATP because moving against the solute concentration is like moving up a slide. 
Notice here that when we are going from a low to a high concentration, it requires energy and is active. There are two major types of active transport that we'll talk about in Bio 168. We'll talk about even more types of active transport in Bio 169. But for right now, we're going to look at primary active transport and vesicular transport. In primary active transport, this uses ATP as a source of energy to power protein pumps. In vesicular transport, this uses ATP to bring solutions into the cell via endocytosis or export them out of the cell via exocytosis. Let's explore further. The sodium potassium pump is a common example of primary active transport. Recall we have more sodium on the outside of our body or outside of our cells and more potassium on the inside. In this figure, the sodium is in the round yellow circles and the potassium is now a pyramid shape. In order to maintain this concentration gradient, the sodium potassium pump exports three sodium ions out of the cell and imports two potassium ions back into the cell. More sodium ions are concentrated outside of the cell and more potassium ions are concentrated inside the cell. This is what forms that resting membrane potential. The inside of the cell membrane has a negative charge relative to the outside of the cell membrane. This is very important in powering nerve impulses and muscle contractions. This makes the cell a battery for the electricity that we need in order to think and move. Here's how the sodium potassium pump works. In order to export sodiums out of the cell, the sodium potassium pump must be open to the interior of the cell. There are three spaces that will attract three sodium ions. When the sodium ions have attached to their binding sites, an ATP will come in and donate its terminal phosphate to the sodium potassium pump. Via the hydrolysis of the ADP molecule or ATP molecule into ADP and inorganic phosphate, this energy changes the shape of the sodium potassium pump so that it is now open to the exterior of the cell. The three sodiums are now able to leave their binding sites on the sodium potassium pump and go to the exterior of the cell. While the sodium potassium pump is open to the exterior, two potassiums are able to come in and bind to their binding sites, shown here as triangle shapes. In order to open the sodium potassium pump to the interior of the cell, the inorganic phosphate must be released from the sodium potassium pump. Once that occurs, the sodium potassium pump is now open to the inside of the cell and the potassiums are released. This leaves the sodium potassium pump able to bind to no three more sodium ions, and the cycle repeats itself. Vesicular transport uses the plasma membrane to move bulk amounts of solutes into, out of, and throughout the cell. Exocytosis occurs when a cell secretes products or expels waste. Endocytosis occurs when substances are transported into a cell. Exo means to exit, so we are transporting out of the cell. Endo means to enter, so we are transporting inside of the cell. Exocytosis occurs when a cell secretes a product such as hormones, antibodies, neurotransmitters, mucus, sweat, and oils. It can also be used to excrete wastes. We will talk about organelles in the next section of this chapter. The organelle we see here is called the Golgi apparatus. Vesicles bud off of the Golgi apparatus and include proteins such as hormones, antibodies, neurotransmitters, mucus, sweat, or oils. These secretory vesicles then make their way to the plasma membrane there, they will fuse to the plasma membrane, the vesicle will, and the secretion will be released into the extracellular fluid.
endocytosis occurs when substances are transported into a cell. There are three types of endocytosis. The first is called phagocytosis. This is when a cell engulfs a large particle such as a bacteria. The example of phagocytosis is the macrophage mentioned earlier, also known as a white blood cell. Let's watch another silent video. I'll walk you through it. This is a white blood cell type of, called a neutrophil. It is going to act as a macrophage. These are erythrocytes or red blood cells. The bacteria will be what the macrophage is interested in. The white blood cell is able to sniff out the bacteria and follow it using a process called chemotaxis. Once it catches up to the bacteria, it will engulf the bacterium through endocytosis. There we go. And this type of endocytosis is called phagocytosis because phago means to eat and cytosis means the cell. So literally, the cell is eating. The next type of endocytosis is called pinocytosis. This is when a cell takes in solutes from a solution. An example of this is the intestinal cells absorbing nutrients. When you digest your food, it enters your intestines as a substance called chyme, which is acidic at the beginning. However, the intestines neutralize it using the bicarbonate ion. As the chyme is neutralized, it then passes through the small intestine and it's the liquid and it contains all of the digested nutrients that your stomach helped to absorb with its acids. So the purpose of the small intestine is to further digest the nutrients through the secretion of enzymes and also to absorb those nutrients through the cell walls of the intestinal cells and they do that through penocytosis. The third type of endocytosis is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. This requires a hormone to direct the endocytosis of solutes. An example of this is insulin and how insulin will direct the absorption of glucose into cells. Phagocytosis is pictured in the first frame and we see the macrophage engulfing a large particle such as a bacteria by putting the membrane, the plasma membrane of the macrophage around the bacteria, pinching it off and bringing it into the cell as a vesicle. In pinocytosis, notice we have nutrients outside of our cells. This would be an intestinal cell and it will be able to take in the nutrients, several nutrients at a time in the solution into a vesicle. In receptor mediated endocytosis, we must have a hormone and the appropriate receptors in order to bring in the nutrients that we need. Now let's look at the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is the interior of the cell. It contains two major components. It contains cytosol, which is the intracellular fluid, and organelles, which are tiny organ-like structures that carry out the functions of the cells. Both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells have non-membranous organelles, such as ribosomes and proteins. Eukaryotic cells also contain membrane-bound organelles, such as the Golgi apparatus mentioned earlier, and vesicles. This shows a typical animal cell. The plasma membrane forms the exterior of the cell and is selectively permeable. Here we see exocytosis occurring as a vesicle is fusing to the plasma membrane and releasing secretions. The cytoplasm is the interior of the cell 
And generally, it is defined as the area between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. The cytosol is the intracellular fluid. The organelles are the tiny organ-like structures found within the cell. The ones with the membrane are pictured like the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. The non-membranous organelles are like these little red dots called ribosomes. We're going to take a look at each of these organelles. And then the last section of this chapter will discuss the nucleus. Membrane-bound organelles are enclosed in a phospholipid bilayer similar to the plasma membrane. They are found in eukaryote cells and include the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, transport vesicles, lysosomes, peroxisomes, and the mitochondria. The rough endoplasmic reticulum, abbreviated rough ER, is continuous with the nucleus and is studded with ribosomes. The rough ER synthesizes proteins that will be used in the plasma membrane. It also synthesizes proteins that will be exported from the cell, such as hormones or neurotransmitters. And a organelle, an organelle called peroxisomes, bud off of the rough ER. This is the rough ER. Notice that it is continuous with the nuclear mem membrane. It is studded with ribosomes because it is involved in protein synthesis. So recall, there are proteins that will be used in the plasma membrane, like transport proteins. There will be proteins that will be exported, such as hormones and neurotransmitters. And then we will see an organelle called a peroxisome bud off of the rough ER. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is abbreviated smooth ER. It is a continuation of the rough ER, but does not contain ribosomes. Its roles are primarily focused on lipid synthesis and storage. Phospholipids and cholesterol used to build cell and organelle membranes are synthesized in the smooth ER. Steroid hormones are also synthesized in the smooth ER. So are, or, and, the smooth ER also stores triglycerides, primarily in the liver and fat cells. If you have ever heard of the liver becoming fatty, that is because of the storage of fat in the smooth ER. This is dangerous. A fatty liver can lead to hepatitis. And then the fat cells are the adipocytes, and that is their job. Their job is to store triglycerides, and the way they do that is in their smooth ER. So again, the smooth ER will synthesize phospholipids and cholesterol used to build the cell and organelle membranes, steroid hormones such as estrogen and testosterone, and it will store triglycerides in the liver and fat cells. Other important roles of the smooth ER include storing glycogen in the liver and skeletal muscles, storing calcium ions in the muscle cells, and detoxifying drugs and alcohol, especially in the liver. There's a lot of smooth ER in the liver, isn't there? This is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Notice that it is continuous with the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and it does not contain ribosomes. So it is primarily concerned with synthesizing and storing fats. Golgi apparatus modifies and packages proteins made by the rough ER into vesicles. Transport vesicles move the protein throughout the cell where they become transport proteins within the plasma membrane, export proteins via exocytosis, or become lysosomes. Lysosomes contain digestive enzymes. They break down old cellular contents, digest harmful bacteria, uh, and resorb bone. Lysosomes are involved in apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. 
Here we see the entire endomembrane system. This includes the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the vesicles that bud off of the rough ER and are transported to the Golgi apparatus, the vesicles that bud off of the Golgi apparatus and are transported to the plasma membrane. So in step one, protein-containing vesicles pinch off the rough ER and migrate to fuse with the membranes of the Golgi apparatus. In step two, proteins are modified within the Golgi compartments. In step three, proteins are then packaged within different vesicle types, depending on their ultimate destination. In pathway A, the vesicle contains contents destined for exocytosis, such as a hormone, a neurotransmitter, or an antibody. In pathway B, the vesicle membrane may be incorporated into the plasma membrane itself to regenerate any plasma membrane lost through endocytosis. In pathway C, the lysosome may be formed, which contains the acid hydrolase enzymes. Lysosomes are like the stomach of the cell. They are able to digest harmful products like the bacteria as seen in the macrophage. Lysosomes also digest dead organelles and they can serve in apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, which is necessary if the cell is sick. It is also what helps to form certain aspects of our body when we are in utero, like your fingers. Your fingers are webbed when you are in your first stages of development, but lysosomes initiate apoptosis in the skin between your fingers, and that removes the webbing and frees your fingers so that they can move as independent units. Let's go back to peroxisomes. Recall that peroxisomes bud off of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Peroxisomes produce the enzyme catalase that neutralizes hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide has a molecular formula of H2O2. This is a byproduct of cellular metabolism and can cause cellular damage. If you notice, hydrogen peroxide is water with an extra mo oxygen molecule attached. Therefore, when catalase does its job, it will break down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. That's why hydrogen peroxide bubbles when you put it on to your wounds. It's because of the catalase enzyme breaking hydrogen peroxide down into water and oxygen. Peroxisomes also digest fatty acids and amino acids, so they can be used by the mitochondria to synthesize ATP. Remember, the mitochondria uses glucose, and it can also use fatty acids and amino acids to synthesize ATP. Glucose begins the journey into the mitochondria through a process called glycolysis that occurs in the cytoplasm. However, fatty acids and amino acids need to go through the peroxisomes and be prepared for cellular respiration before they can go into the mitochondria. Peroxisomes detoxify drugs and alcohol. They can also protect against kidney stones. Between the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and your peroxisomes, your cells are pretty good at neutralizing toxins. This is what a peroxisome looks like. It has a lipid bilayer and this interesting crystalline core. Just a couple of examples of the difference between the lysosomes and peroxisomes. Lysosomes break down biological polymers like proteins and polysaccharides, whereas peroxisomes oxidize organic compounds and they break down metabolic hydrogen peroxide. Lysosomes have digestive enzymes. Peroxisomes have oxidative enzymes. Remember, they're breaking down peroxide into oxygen and water. Energy is required to synthesize and package proteins and move vesicles throughout the cell. 
Mitochondria use cellular respiration to regenerate ATP molecules to provide energy for these functions. Cellular respiration is aerobic. It must use oxygen to fully oxidize glucose and fatty acids. Also, amino acids can be included in this. You generally want to use glucose and fatty acids before you use amino acids, though. Amino acids are used to synthesize proteins. We need to use our amino acids to synthesize proteins rather than generate energy. If we are starving, however, we will start to break down our amino acids as energy instead of synthesizing enzymes and muscles. This is called wasting away. All right, mitochondria contain bacterial DNA and ribosomes. This is evidence that mitochondria was once a free living bacterium. Many, many years ago, they formed a symbiotic relationship with eukaryotic cells. Symbiosis means that they work together. The number of mitochondria varies per cell. The more energy needs of a cell equals the more mitochondria present. Mitochondria account for 30% of the volume of muscle cells. Red blood cells have no mitochondria. This is because red blood cells' main job is to transport oxygen through the body. Therefore, there are no mitochondria present Elsewise, the red blood cells would undergo cellular respiration and use that oxygen. This is an image of the mitochondria. Remember, the mitochondria has two membranes, an inner membrane, which contains the electron transport chain and the ATP synthase enzymes that synthesize the ATP molecules from ADP and inorganic phosphate. Non-membranous organelles are composed of RNA or proteins that are not enclosed in a phospholipid membrane. Recall that non-membranous organelles can be found in prokaryotes as well as eukaryotes. So they are found in all cells and they include ribosomes and the proteins that they synthesize and the cytoskeleton. Ribosomes are composed of ribosomal RNA, abbreviated rRNA, and proteins. Ribosomal subunits are assembled in the nucleolus of the nucleus. Ribosomes function to synthesize proteins. There are free-floating ribosomes that synthesize proteins that function inside the cell, like internal enzymes. There are membrane-bound ribosomes that synthesize proteins intended for use in the cell membrane, within lysosomes, or for export from the cell. Therefore, these membrane-bound ribosomes are found in the rough ER. This illustration shows the ribosome structure and function in protein synthesis. There are two ribosomal subunits, a large subunit and a small subunit. When they are not synthesizing proteins, these subunits are not attached. It is only when protein synthesis initiates that these uh, subunits will join together. This activates the ribosome. The ribosome can then synthesize proteins by reading a messenger RNA molecule and adding the appropriate amino acids to the growing polypeptide chain. The cytoskeleton is a network of proteins that are interwoven throughout the cell. There are three main cytoskeletal elements. The first are microtubules, which are made of tubulin subunits. Microtubules serve as the cytoskeletal highway for motor proteins to carry vesicles, and they form the mitotic spindle fibers used to separate chromosomes during cell division. So basically, the chromosomes are pulled apart from each other by the action of microtubules. This video shows a motor protein walking a vesicle along a microtubule. It's another silent video, so I'll talk you through it. It's very quick. It's computer generated, but here we see the vesicle, the microtubule, and the motor protein. The motor protein is called a kinesin. 
It has motor feet that are activated by ATP cycling. The hydrolysis of the ATP and the phosphorylation of the protein will activate these feet so that they move. The head of the kinesin will have receptors that will attach to the vesicle. The microtubules are shown throughout the cell and serve as the roadways for the vesicles to be transported throughout the cell. So when we looked at the endomembrane system from the rough endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus to the plasma membrane, the vesicles are not simply floating through the cell. They are being carried from each organelle by these kinesins on the microtubule highway. If that's not cool, I don't know what cool is. There are images of these motor proteins that are taken by high-powered microscopes. I suggest checking them out when you get a chance. The second type of cytoskeletal element is the microfilament. Microfilaments are made of actin subunits. These reinforce the cell shape. They also help the cell move and help muscles contract. We will see the microfilaments of actin when we talk about muscle contraction. The third type of cytoskeletal element are the intermediate filaments. These include strong structural proteins such as keratin. Keratin strengthens and joins cells together in tissues. Keratin is different than collagen because keratin is found inside of the cell. Collagen is an extracellular protein secreted by fibroblasts. So it is around the living cells, but not inside of them. Keratin is inside. This illustration shows the three cytoskeletal structural proteins. The microfilaments shown in green contain actin. The intermediate filaments shown in blue contain keratin. The microtubules shown in red contain tubulin. This illustration shows the motor proteins that we watched in the video walking the vesicle along a microtubule. There are two vesicles pictured in this photograph as well as a microtubule. There will be motor proteins that are walking those vesicles from one area of the cell to another. This shows a giant squid axon two vesicles containing neurotransmitters migrating towards the tip of the axon. Now let's talk about cell extensions and junctions. Cells may function to propel substances across the surface of a tissue, such as in the respiratory tract. Cilia are hair-like and move substances along the cell surface. Some cells need to move through their environment, such as sperm. Flagella are longer and wider than cilia and propel the entire cell. Both cilia and flagella are made of microtubules. Some cells absorb nutrients from the GI tract. Microvilli are extensions of the plasma membrane that increase the surface area for absorption. We see microvilli in the cells of the small intestine and they can absorb more nutrients due to the increased surface area of their plasma membrane formed by these microvilli. Cells must be joined together to form tissues and organs. There are three types of cell junctions that we'll talk about. The first is the tight junction. This is strands or rows of proteins leaking cells together. This prevents substances from passing between cells and requires materials to move through rather than between cells. 
Basically, it forms a watertight barrier as best as it can. Desmosomes are composed of proteins that bind neighboring cells together. They act as guy wires to prevent cells in tissues from tearing during stretch and movement. Guy wires are like the steel wires of a bridge and they help to absorb the tension as a car crosses the bridge. Gap junctions form tiny fluid filled tunnels and provide direct passageway for substances to travel between cells. A good example of this is the movement of ions between cells in the cardiac muscles. This is convenient because heart cells have to beat in unison and through the movement of ions through the gap junctions, all the cells are receiving the ion flow at the same rate and can thus pump in unison. This illustration shows the three types of junctions. The first is the tight junction. Here we see the membrane protein that has basically bolted the plasma membrane together. The second illustration shows the desmosome. Here we see the protein filaments and the intermediate filaments such as keratin extending into the adjacent cells so that as the cells are moved around in their space, they can stay together without tearing apart. The third illustration shows the gap junction. The gap junctions are pores made of proteins called connexons, and ions can flow from cell to cell. This is particularly important in cardiac muscles. They are called intercalated discs in the cardiac muscles. The last section of this chapter talks about the nucleus. The nucleus is usually the largest organelle in a eukaryote cell. The nucleus contains DNA and the genes that code for the synthesis of proteins. Chromatin is DNA in the relaxed state Chromosomes form when DNA gets ready for cell division. This illustration shows the relaxed form of DNA called chromatin inside the nucleus. This central structure is the nucleolus, where ribosomes are synthesized. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes in each nucleus except for the egg or sperm, which have one pair each. Chromosomes appear banded from the patterns of genes. Genes have unique variations from person to person. This is a karyograph showing the 23 pairs of chromosomes. These are the coiled chromatin that are ready for cell division. Genes are written in a series of triplets within the DNA. Triplets contain three nucleotides each and code for amino acids. DNA cannot leave the nucleus. Thus, in order for a gene to leave the nucleus to become a protein, the process of transcription must occur. In transcription, a messenger RNA, abbreviated mRNA, is built complementary to the triplets. The complements are called codons. This table shows the DNA triplets in the first column, the mRNA codon in the second column, and the corresponding amino acid in the third column. So the triplet of DNA, AAA, would be transcripted onto a messenger RNA as UUU. -U -U. Recall that RNA has uracil instead of thymine. UUU, the codon, corresponds to the amino acid phenylalanine. Another example is the DNA triplet AAT. The complement to that would be UUA. Remember, complementary base pairs. A will bind to U. A will bind to U. T 
will bind to A. That is how the complementary codon is made, and we call it complementary base pairs. The amino acid that corresponds to UUA is the amino acid leucine. You can see the other examples in this table. Here is the mRNA molecule that is built from a strand of DNA triplets. It is not the one that is pictured in this table here. This is another picture. But it just shows you that the mRNA will contain codons that corresponded to the DNA triplets. So in codon 1 here, we see GCU. We can easily figure out what the DNA triplet would have been. It would have been C, G, A. In codon 2, we can see that it contains A, C, G. So we can figure out the DNA triplet from that. It would have been T, G, C. Do you see the trend of complements? Here's another example. Transcription occurs in the nucleus of a cell. So first we have our gene, which is contained on the DNA and thus has triplets. So the triplet that they have highlighted here is C-A-T. In order to build the mRNA, we must use the complements. The complement to C is G on an RNA. The complement to A is U on an RNA. And the complement to T is A on an RNA. So therefore, our first codon in our strand of mRNA is G-U-A. This is transcription, to transcribe. Scribe means to write. So basically we are writing the triplets of DNA onto the codons of mRNA. Translation occurs in the cytoplasm. Once the mRNA leaves the nucleus, it needs to bind to a ribosome for protein synthesis to occur. As the messenger RNA is read by the ribosome, Transfer RNA, abbreviated tRNA, molecules containing anticodons and amino acids are attracted to the mRNA ribosome complex. The tRNA translates the codons from the mRNA into amino acids on a growing polypeptide chain. The mRNA has binded to the ribosome and the two subunits then will connect. Once the two subunits are connected around the mRNA molecule, translation can occur. When we translate something, we translate from one language into the other. So basically what we're doing is we're translating the mRNA into amino acids. We do this by using complements again. The complements of the mRNA codons are called anticodons, and they are found on the TN tRNA molecule. So what has to happen is the complements must match. In this example, here we see the codon GGC. It will match with its complementary anticodon CCG. And this contains the amino acid glycine. The genetic code matches the codons to their corresponding amino acids. The codon is what would be on the messenger RNA. You figure it out by looking at the first letter on the left-hand column, the second letter on the top row, and the third letter on the right-hand column. So for the codon UUU, we match U on the top row of the first letter with U on the top row of the second letter, and then U on the top row of the third letter, U, U, U. And here we can see that it corresponds to phenylalanine. The important thing to see here is there's a lot of repetition. We use a lot of different triplets and codons to account for or code for the same amino acid. So here are four different codons that all code for alanine. This is kind of helpful to ensure that, you know, if there are little base pair changes, it won't ultimately alter the protein too much.
because it may code for that very same amino acid. Changes in base pair sequences are called mutations. Sometimes mutations can be beneficial and they can lead to evolution by natural selection. Sometimes mutations can be harmful and they can lead to death or illness in the individual, such as cancer. Let's talk about cancer. Cancer is an illness that disrupts normal rates of cell division. It is characterized by permanent DNA sequence changes called mutations. Cancer most commonly occurs in epithelial tissues with actively dividing cells. Examples of these include skin, lung, glands, and the lining of the colon. Cancerous cells compete with normal cells for resources. This usually begins with a single abnormal cell. The cancerous cell does not undergo apoptosis. Instead, it undergoes accelerated mitosis. A tumor, also called a neoplasm, is a mass or swelling produced by abnormal cell growth and division. There are two major types of tumors, a benign tumor and a malignant tumor. In a benign tumor, cells remain within the original tissue. They're generally capsulated. They are seldom a threat unless they are found in the brain or spinal tissue. They can be removed surgically if necessary. This is an example of a benign tumor called dermatofibroma. It is just a tumor of fibroblast found in the skin. It forms a nodule that may very well resemble basal cell carcinoma, and so it is a good idea to get it checked out. It can be removed if wanted. Here's the formation of a benign tumor. The abnormal cell begins to undergo accelerated mitosis. However, it is generally encapsulated and the cells stay in one place. In a malignant tumor, the cells divide rapidly. Chemicals are released that stimulate blood vessel growth called angiogenesis to the tumor area. So tumors will have blood vessels growing into them. They will be highly inflamed and can be very hot. Accelerated growth occurs due to blood vessel growth and supply to the area. These tissues or these tumors are hungry and they grow and use up nutrients in your body. The tumor will then spread to the surrounding tissue by invasion. If the cells migrate to other areas and establish new tumors, this is a process called metastasis. And we say that the cancer has metastasized. This is the process of metastasis. Here we see angiogenesis, or the growth of blood vessels, into the tumor cells. When invasion begins, the tumor is no longer growing as a relatively isolated mass of cells. The abnormal cells are now migrating into the surrounding tissues. Some malignant cells may cross the walls of the blood vessels in the area, and this is a process called penetration. These cells may then begin circulating throughout the body. Responding to cues that are as yet unknown, cancer cells in the bloodstream ultimately escape out of the blood vessels to establish secondary tumors at other sites. These tumors are extremely active metabolically and their presence stimulates the growth of new blood vessels into the area. The increased blood supplies provides additional nutrients to the cancer cells and further accelerates tumor growth and metastasis. Malignant cells disrupt tissue function and compete with normal cells for space and nutrients. Cells no longer perform their original functions or they perform functions in an abnormal way. For example, a malignant tumor of the thyroid gland produces abnormal amounts of thyroid hormone. Here are the stages of cancer. In stage one, this is early stage, a small invasive mass or tumor has been found. No spread yet to the lymph nodes or other tissues, sometimes called early stage or localized cancer. In stage two, this is localized, the cancer has started to affect nearby tissue. 
the mass may have grown in size and it has spread to lymph nodes near the mass, which is starting to invade other areas. In stage three, or regional spread, the cancer affects more surrounding tissues. The masses may have grown in size and they may have spread to distant lymph nodes away from the mass. In stage four, or distant spread, the cancer has spread to other tissues or organs beyond the region where it originated. Sometimes this is called advanced or metastatic cancer. Here we see lung cancer that has metastasized. You may also see the cancers with A and B categories. So you may see stage 1A or stage 1B, stage 2A, stage 2B, 3A, 3B, 4A, 4B. And to break the sadness of cancer, here's a comic for you, membrane pranks. Here's a phospholipid telling the hydrophobic tales, hey guys, look, I have a water gun. All right. Thank you all for tuning in and listening. Have a blessed day.